the more I learn about Sam Bankman Freed, the less I like him. And while at least now he's uncomfortable for the first time in his life, it'll be curious to see if his friends come help him out, his political friends. Is the government just starting to pile on for Alex Murdoch? Nah. A civil lawsuit is filed regarding the death of Athena Strands, and I'm not sure I agree with it. The Chrisleys will know the BOP. That sounds like a new reality show. And then finally, our dumb criminal of the day. Let's talk about it. Welcome to Crime Talk. My name is Scott Reich. You know the drill. Subscribe if you haven't. Like if you do. Hit that little bell so you receive notifications. And as always, leave me a comment below. Now you know we must support the people that help support Crime Talk. So go to crimetalksearch.com, sign up for a background subscription service. You're going to be happy that you did because when you do, you can do as many background searches that you want on anyone that you desire while you have that subscription and you can cancel at any time. And the report is literally generated while you wait and then it can be emailed to you. And it's going to have information as to whether somebody has a criminal history, whether uh, they own property or not, whether they're married or divorced. You know, some of those important things you want to find out that may not necessarily show up on that simple Google search. Go to crimetalksearch.com. You'll be happy you did. Let's go ahead and open the record for the docket for December 16th, 2022. All right, as I said in the intro, the more that I learn about the Sam Bankman Freed guy, the less that I like him. Now, he is a con man. Now, we'll give him the presumption of innocence. Come on, it's not like he just made billions of dollars disappear because it was all fake. So was he really a billionaire? Mm, I don't know, probably not, because it was all pretend. It really was, and he was con man. So as he sits there in his little Bahamian prison cell, waiting extradition back to the United States, well, let's just say it's not gonna be a comfortable holiday season indeed. He's not getting his vegan dietary uh, restrictions, and he may not be getting his ADD medication either. But I did mention the other day, my first thought was when I saw this guy was, who would give money to this guy? He looks homeless. He looks homeless. Um, and so I was scrolling through something the other night. And what did I see? I see Joe Rogan. And take a look at this video. I think this just about sums it up. You want some dude who gets up at 530 in the morning, reads the Wall Street Journal, and then gets on a treadmill. Yeah. And, and I don't care what his religion is. Just I don't say give that. a what his religion is. I want that dude drinking carrot juice. Yeah. I want him taking vitamins. I want him doing push-ups and sit-ups and being disciplined. And that guy gets his tie on right and he makes his cuffs perfect and that guy goes to work yeah and he does it by the book and he makes a load of money he's got a patek philippe watch on and he, he's got a private jet he knows what the he's doing he's been doing it the right way for years yeah he's, those you can't dress like that you can't have those man tits no. hanging out and i give you a billion dollars of bitcoin <laughs> some 26 year old kid lives in the bahamas is nine other people he's banging living in a sex cult exactly exactly the man looks homeless does he entrust does he instill trust and confidence? No way whatsoever. Neither does his girlfriend. No way would I give a million dollars, let alone a billion dollars to that guy to manage my money. That's for sure. And I've always said this because, hey, I've represented a lot of white collar criminals over the years. And I truly believe one of the reasons that uh, we should have a uh, jury instruction in white collar cases, it should be called greed. And yes, I feel bad for the people that lost their money and they put their life savings in. But let's face it, they thought that they were all going to get rich. And if anyone's ever, you know, made a few bucks in your life, it doesn't just happen like that. It takes a lot of hard work, time, being disciplined. It doesn't just happen overnight at all. And so, that's why I'm saying a lot of these people put their money in because they thought they were going to get rich overnight without having to do the work. You always got to do the work. So the next question becomes, will his friends, will Sam Bankman Freed's friends come to his aid? Well, we know one of his friends resides at the White House. And when the uh, White House press secretary was uh, being asked questions the other day, Karine Jean-Pierre wouldn't say whether President Biden 
would ask his aides to return the 2020 campaign contributions from Sam Bankman Freed. And as we know, he was obviously just charged with swindling investors out of at least, at least, give or take, $1.8 billion. And it turns out Mr. Bankman Freed was one of the Democrat Party's largest donors and even met with the Biden's White House advisors before his uh, currency exchange, also known as FTX, collapsed in uh, what's going to go down as one of the largest American frauds. It makes Ponzi and Madoff look like amateurs, doesn't it? I mean, this guy, who, like I said, look at him. He looks homeless. I mean, I just, who would do that? I wouldn't do that. Anyway, it turns out that the president received some campaign uh, donations from Sam Bankman Freed. And um, like I said, the uh, press secretary said she's not sure how it's going to happen. Klein tried to say that it was because of the Hatch Act uh, that she could not respond, which is basically an act saying that you can't campaign for certain things when you are actually working as a federal employee. My guess is some point they will. But we also know that he was welcomed at least twice to the West Wing for meetings with uh, President uh, Biden's top aides, one of his top aides who's named Steve Ricchetti. That's according to the visitor logs that have been released. Now, it's unclear who else he may have met with during his meetings back in April and May. But, hey, what can you do? They're all friends, right? Anyway, Bankman Freed gave $50,000 in October to the 2020 Biden Victory Fund and another 2,800 directly to the Biden campaign that same month. And that's according to the Federal Election Commission records. You know, the 2,800 is the individual cap that an individual can give to somebody. Of course, there's all kinds of exceptions to those rules. But since the collapse of FTX, uh, the White House has referred all the questions regarding contributions to the Democratic National Committee, which is responsible for these kinds of inquiries, apparently. In the 2020 election, Mr. Bankman Freed spent $10 million backing Mr. Biden's campaign, much of that indirectly. Now, Bankman Freed was the second largest donor to congressional Democrats ahead of last term, ahead of last month's midterms elections, where he donated a paltry $39.2 million, second only to George Soros. You know, one thing I've learned about theft cases over the years, it's really easy to spend other people's money. I had a lady years ago that embezzled all kinds of money from a very successful businessman. And um, by the end of it, she had nothing to show for it, but she spent a lot of money. She gambled, she bought a lot of lingerie, and apparently, well, she got a breast job as well. It's easy to go squander other people's money that you didn't actually have to work for. Now, let's be honest, some of the people that received money were Republicans, but uh, clearly, uh, disproportionately, the money went to uh, Democrats. And a lot of people are now wondering whether Sam Bankman Freed's FTX managed to avoid regulations and utilize some of the loopholes in the banking and financial system because of, well, perhaps of all his political contributions. Can you imagine such a thing? Could you imagine such a thing where somebody would actually give money to a politician and expect, I don't know, political favors? If there was only a word for that, if there was only a word for that, oh, graft, I think that's the word. That's right. So the donations total about $46.5 million. Um, that's a lot of money. That's a lot of money. And there, now there's a lot of people in the media who are trying to say, oh, old Sam Bankman Freed, he just really didn't know. Look at him, he's so naive. He didn't know what he was doing. It's not his fault. I don't know. Could that be because of all the money that he spent with them as well? I don't know. But the reality of it is he's gonna found he's gonna be found to be a criminal. But hey, it's only white collar crime, couple billion dollars. I mean, why should he be that worried? Uh, remember Elizabeth Holmes from the Theranos um, fake company as well? I mean, she only squandered a billion dollars from some pretty sophisticated investors. And what did she get, 11 years? Her boyfriend got 13? I mean, would you gamble to be a billionaire for 11 years? I don't know. Well, anyway, 
Some of the politicians have returned at least $1.2 million of the contributions that old SBF sent. Um, one of them is old Beto O'Rourke. He returned $1 million before FTX filed for bankruptcy, apparently saw the writing on the wall. Uh, the previous U.S. representative uh, stated that he did not ask for the donation and therefore he just gave it back. Although O'Rourke did receive an additional $100,000 from FTX, and it's unclear whether that money was going to be returned as well. Then you have U.S. Senator Dick Durbin. He got about $2,900. Uh, he donated that money to a charitable organization. U.S. Senator Christine Gildebrand received about $16,000 from SBF. She also stated that she'll donate that to a charity. And last but not least, we have Jesus Garcia. He received about $2,900 from SBF, and he decided to donate those funds to a Northwestern center in Chicago. But how about the money that went to the people that were supposedly going to be regulating old FTX and old Sam Bankman Freed? How about those guys? Well, the people on the committee, he pumped about $95,000 in donations to at least 11 House Financial Service Committee members ahead of the 2022 midterms. Now, the individual campaign donations have raised a little bit of uh, some eyebrows, I guess you could say, as the people that were serving on the committee are also now currently probing how the collapse of FTX took place. The majority of the contributions were made to Democrats with the New York Representative Richie Torres got about $35,000 from various FTX-linked donors, according to the Federal Election Commission. The House Financial Service Committee, which has 53 members, uh, was set to grill Bankman Freed Tuesday of this week at a congressional hearing, but obviously that didn't happen because the homeless looking man uh, was arrested and is now sitting in a Bahamian uh, jail. Let's see, um, we have uh, Representative Richie Torres. Uh, he got $2,900 directly from old FTX founder as well as FTX founders uh, Gabriel Bankman Freed, who contributed about $32,000 to the Torres Campaign Victory Fund. And um, he said it was unsolicited, but he'll be uh, donating that amount. He said that his ties were minimal and also insisted uh, was uh, that Mr. Bankman Freed was a pathological liar. Then we have Josh Gottheimer from New Jersey. He received about $5,800 from old Sam Bankman Freed. He also received two separate donations of $2,900 each from FTX executives, Mark Wetgen, who previously worked as commissioner of the Commodities Future Trading Commission. A spokesperson for the representative, Gott Meyer, uh, said that he will be donating funds to a charity. Then we have representative Jake Ochenkloss from Massachusetts, who is the vice chair of the committee. He got about 5,800 bucks in personal donations from Bankman Freed as well as, guess right, the executive, Mr. Wetgen. There you go. And it just keeps going and going and going. Now, can you imagine, ladies and gentlemen? I mean, I get it. The reason why people donate to politicians, it's not because they really like the guy. At least companies don't. They do it because they expect something in return. That's it. And if you can't donate the money directly, you know, maybe you got a brother who's got that, you know, real estate deal that he's been working on, that maybe could use some help. It's all graft, it's all money laundering, ladies and gentlemen, which gets me, you know, term limit them all, keep them out of there. Uh, you know, public service used to be actually that, public service. They picked the person to go off to office that didn't really want the job. No one was ever meant to be a career politician when the country was founded. It wasn't supposed to be that complicated anyway. And now you got money, you got fraud, everybody pointing fingers at everybody. We'll see if somebody else is indicted shortly. And certainly a lot of these people got to be, you know, feeling the little pucker factor right about now, just simply thinking, boy, what did I tell this guy? Or what did he tell me I should know or not know? And how many people could get in trouble? I don't know. It's the kind of guy you have to be careful for him. He could get uh, he could get suicided in his cell. You just never know how those things work out. All right, next on the docket, are the is the government just starting to pile on for Alex Murdoch? 
I don't think so. All right, so you know Alec Murdoch is currently um, in custody pending the double murder charges in the uh, June 7th, 2021 deaths of his wife, Maggie, and son, Paul, on the family's 1,700-acre estate. He's pled not guilty to those charges and is scheduled to go to trial on January 23rd. As it turns out, Alex Murdoch, who earned millions of dollars from his Hampton, South Carolina law practice over the last nine years, well, apparently didn't pay all the taxes. At the same time, he stole millions from his firm and uh, clients as well. Guess what? The state of South Carolina has indicted him on tax evasion. That's right. The South Carolina Attorney General Office announced today that Mr. Murdoch was indicted by a state grand jury on nine counts of willful attempt to evade or defeat a tax. Now, it is alleged that between 2011 and 2019, according to the 11-page indictment, that Mr. Murdoch failed to report more than $6.9 million of income earned through illegal acts causing him to owe the state taxable income that was unreported. The South Carolina's tax agency, the Department of Revenue, participated in the investigation of Mr. Murdoch. Uh, others who investigated were also the South Carolina Law Enforcement Division and the FBI, and let's not forget the United States Attorney's Office. So maybe when all this state stuff is wrapped up, he's gonna get indicted by the feds as well. So as I noted, the uh, indictment that came down today also reveals how much Mr. Murdoch earned as a lawyer for each of the nine years between 2011 and 2019. Now, listen to this because it makes you wonder, this guy was broke. He was robbing Peter to pay Paul. Makes you wonder what the hell was he spending it on? So the indictment alleges that Mr. Murdoch reported annual income as a lawyer from his former law firm, Peters, Murdoch, Parker, Ellsroth, and Dietrich, and that began to drop as the years passed as uh, he supplemented his income as a lawyer by alleged thefts he did not report on his tax forms. In 2011, he earned $2.3 million, then $5.2 million in 2012. By 2013, Murdoch's annual pay dropped to $733,000, but went back up to $1 million and uh, to two million in 2014 and 2015, respectively. So he earned $962,000 in 2016, then $270,000 in 2017, and earned $823,000 in 2018. In 2019, the final year, he earned $722,000. I mean, who could possibly get by on that kind of money? It's nearly impossible, <laughs> Mr. Murdoch. Really? So in all of those 19 years, he earned $14 million and stole another $7 million more, according to the indictment. So the uh, attorney general says, hey, you know what? You owe the state of South Carolina $486,819 in unpaid taxes. Seems like a small price to pay. I mean, actually, that's a pretty good rate um, on $14 million. If I brought in $14 million and only had to pay $486,000 in taxes on it, <laughs> sign me up. Anyway, Mr. Murdoch, the hits just keep coming. So he's got the homicide case. Now he's got the tax evasion case. Plus, he's got all those other theft cases that he's going. Things are just not looking good for Mr. Murdoch. And his current attorneys didn't uh, say whether they're going to appear on this particular case. You know, they only got a paltry $600,000 for the double homicide case and the other matters. And uh, as you'd have to tell any client, um, we don't give a volume discount. It actually gets more complicated the more cases you have. So arrangements are gonna have to be made to um, come up with a new retainer for the new case if they would like him to represent them. All right, next on the docket, let's talk about a civil case coming out of a very tragic uh, criminal case. Uh, hopefully you all remember the case of Athena Strand. Uh, she was the seven-year-old girl who was kidnapped and strangled by the FedEx driver. Well, Jacob Strand, the father of St Athena Strand, um, like I said, his daughter was kidnapped and strangled by a FedEx driver outside of Dallas in November. And he filed a million-dollar lawsuit against the delivery company and the suspect, that guy, Tanner Horner. Now, I understand the dad is upset. He wants justice. He's not going to get it from Tanner Horner because he can't go into a room and just do terrible things to him. He's got to go through the court system. But a civil lawsuit, I get it. We'll talk about it more. So anyway, Mr. Strand, um, so 
So Athena Strand vanished from her father's home in Wise County on November 30th. Her body was recovered two days later. Horner, the FedEx driver, told investigators that he accidentally hit the young Strand. And uh, when he was backing up his truck, he panicked, and then he ultimately strangled the uh, seven-year-old to death. Well, in this lawsuit, Jacob Strand named the contractor hired by FedEx that employed Horner, a company called Big Top Spin. One section of the lawsuit alleges that FedEx put dangerous persons in a position of trust, even though Horner wasn't employed directly by the packaging giant. He was a contractor. Another section accuses FedEx of having significant control of people who come to uh, customers' homes. And uh, Mr. Strand argues that neither FedEx nor Big Top Spin ran a proper background check on the suspect, who it looks like has no criminal history until this particular case. Anyway, the lawsuit uh, says that Big Top Spin serves the area where Strand was last seen. FedEx owns the van driven by the suspect, and the suspect was authorized to wear a company uniform. A, a statement uh, on Strand's employment from FedEx stated, the employees of the service provider companies are subject to criminal background checks as part of their driver eligibility process. It also states, as is common across the country in industry and considered standard employment practices, the background check process is administered by a third party. Now, the uh, slain girl's family is seeking $1 million in damages. And in a brief statement, FedEx also said that they were aware of the suit, adding our thoughts remain with the family of Athena Strand in the wake of this tragedy. Now, Mr. Horner, the guy that actually harmed the young Miss Strand, is facing capital charges of murder and aggravated kidnapping. He's currently being held on a $1.5 million bail. Athena Strand was laid to rest on December 9th. So here's what I, I, I we see a lot of this type of situation. We saw in the Petito matter. Um, now we're seeing this here. And with all due respect to Mr. Strand, I get it. Your daughter's gone. I couldn't imagine. My heart goes out to you. But how in the heck is that FedEx or the local contractor's fault? If Tanner Horner, the suspect, went to work that day and said, hey, you know what? I'm going to uh, hit a small child, panic, throw her in the back of the van, strangle her, then yes, the company would have liability. But this was just because you did something at work doesn't mean that the employer is responsible for the actions of that employee. Um, I get the pain, but I just, I got a real problem with that. Um, everybody thinks when something happens bad at a business that somehow the business is ultimately responsible for uh, everything. It just simply is not the case. So I don't know. I just have a real problem with it. Next in the docket, Todd and Julie Chrisley. They may not have known best, but they're going to get to know the BOP. That's right, the Bureau of Prisons. So Todd and Julie Chrisley, who were sentenced last month to prison for fraud and tax crimes, are going to serve out their sentences at a minimum security facility in Florida, just a short two-hour drive from each other. Now, isn't that sweet? Not like they're going to be driving to see each other, though. So Todd was sentenced to 12 years with three years of supervised release. That's parole. And he has been assigned to serve time at the federal prison camp in Pensacola, Florida, which has been described as one of the cushiest prisons in the United States. Now, before everybody gets outraged, let's face it. If you got somebody in there for tax evasion, they're not probably the threat to other prisoners as, you know, a gang member who rules by brute force. Let's just get for real. So they don't need uh, to put everybody in basically the worst prisons everywhere. So let's just be clear with that. Now his wife, Julie, is going to serve uh, seven years in prison and uh, three years of supervised release upon her release, but she's going to be at the, at the nearby Federal Correctional Institution, Mariana. Now, for those who aren't familiar, these two are reality TV stars known for their series, Chris Lee Knows Best, and they were found guilty in June of conspiracy to defraud banks out of more than $30 million in loans. They were also found guilty of several tax crimes, including attempting to defraud the Internal Revenue Service. We wish them well. Now you may ask, well, how did they just find out where they're going to go? Well, in the federal system, you can actually ask for a self-surrender, assuming it's not a crime of violence, 
And if you don't show up, obviously you get more charges, but uh, the BOP will designate what facility you have to be at, and usually within 30 days you must surrender to begin your sentence. I can start a whole new reality series. Chrisley's know the BOP. I can see it now. It'll be like Orange is the New Black, only from Pensacola, Florida. All right, and finally today, our dumb criminal of the day. Yes, this young college student is behind bars after two residents who don't know him found him naked in their apartment in Gainesville, Florida. So apparently on Monday evening, the Gainesville Police Department uh, responded and arrested Alberto Areya on charges of burglary and multiple counts of property damage. Officers say that around 6 p.m., Araya was recorded on security footage damaging the exit sign at the standard apartments while wearing only a pair of green shorts. He then allegedly entered the apartment of people that he doesn't know. When the two residents returned home, guess what? They found Araya standing completely naked in their living room. Needless to say, the residents were not uh, amused and they left. Araya left about 15 minutes later. Still not wearing any clothes, but inside the apartment, hundreds of dollars of damage was done to the apartment. Araya claimed that he was inside the apartment because he believed his wife was home. That's where she lived. He claimed that one of the victims was in fact his wife, but wasn't sure exactly which one. It was also determined later that Mr. Araya, well, he's not married, and he's certainly not married to the two ladies that were there. So Mr. Araya, Congratulations, you made it. You're a dumb criminal of the day. I'm gonna go on a limb here. I'm gonna say he's either been drinking, although there was no mention of indicia of alcohol, or perhaps he was using some sort of controlled substance and things went terribly, terribly wrong. Anyway, congratulations, you made it. One day you're just a young college student walking around naked in other people's apartments. Next thing you know, you're catapulted to the winner of the dumb criminal of the day. Congratulations. All right. Have a wonderful weekend. We will see you next week on Crime Talk.